we're going to be talking about the uh, interesting topic of striking a balance between people and machines. So if uh, you know, we're already a little bit behind schedule, if you could each just introduce yourselves and your company and keep it kind of brief. Sure. Can everybody hear me? This is good. So my name is Mikhail. I'm the uh, Chief Strategy Officer of a company called Digital Genius. We're at the intersection of machine intelligence and customer service. Um, our company thesis is that customer service is a sensitive enough area where it will not be solved by uh, the next best chatbot or a fully automated system uh, for the long foreseeable future. Um, and with that thesis, we are creating a platform that combines the best of human and machine intelligence in a seamless environment. Um, we're doing that through the use of deep neural networks, um, it's a pretty popular topic these days with technologists, and deploying it with enterprise clients like KLM Airlines, Unilever, One Global Bank, an insurance company, and a few others. So we're a fairly early stage company, venture backed, recently closed our second round of funding, and um, excited to share a little bit about how humans and machines can work together practically today to create value in the contact center. I'm Bob Salabarger. I'm the Senior Vice President of Sales Operations and now the newly minted Managing Director of European Sales for Interactions. Uh, Interactions is a speech and uh, natural language understanding company. Uh, we provide uh, enterprise customer service, virtual assistance across both speech and text-based channels to large enterprises. So if you've got a smartphone in your pocket, it's likely when you call for customer care, you maybe actually speaking to us. This is a, a customized hosted application uh, type of a solution focused on high volume transactional customer care. Hi, I'm Peter Barrett. I'm Chief Technical Officer for Creative Virtual. For those of you who don't know the company, we're a, a London-based company with a global network of offices. Um, our primary focus, our pure focus, is really on virtual assistants, natural language technology. We've been integrating with live chat solutions for almost a decade, I would guess. Um, started off with live person at the enterprise level. And the thing we're seeing more than anything else is the explosion in the number of live chat providers, especially at the lower end of the market. Uh, nowadays, I, I guess we're integrating with six or eight different live chat providers. And in total, we probably have been asked to or have done proof of concepts with as many as 15 or 16 different live chat providers. Okay, thanks. And I know you had wanted to play a clip, but maybe before we do sure. that, let's just kind of go down the line really quickly and, and give give the audience your your view of the role of live agents and how they can interact most efficiently or effectively with, uh, with uh, intelligent assistance. So kind of what's your, what's your thinking on the topic, but to keep, it, keep it sort of brief. We'll start with you, Mikhail. Thank you. Uh, for us, it's very simple. We think the machine should do what the machine does best, uh, process massive amounts of data, surface suggestions, and the human should do what the human does best, which is empathize, show care, and handle very sensitive situations where people really, really need that human touch. Um, and to achieve that, we're building, instead of a, a great chatbot or a great AI for the consumer, we're actually building an AI for the agent. And it helps them do their job significantly better. So we're not cutting them out of the equation, very much empowering them with the next generation of machine intelligence technologies. When it comes to the mix of you know, artificial and human intelligence, when it relates to our company, typically that has to do with how we achieve understanding at a very high level. So when we deliver uh, virtual assistant applications or solutions to our customers, we leverage a mix actually of automated understanding, so in the form of speech recognition and natural language processing. But where this can't perform, we use live human, uh, we call them intent analysts, to sort of fill in the, think of it as the 10 or 15 or 20 percent at the top, where speech recognition performs poorly off the shelf. And when you combine them in that fashion, you're able to uh, really enable application designers to uh, conceive applications that are incredibly natural and human-like, like people have never seen before. Maybe after Peter speaks, I'll play right. that clip yeah. so you can, it's good to get a little multimedia into these things, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I guess we see virtual assistants as uh, a natural automation. There's 
uh, high degree, 80% plus of the call center traffic can be handled by automated assistance. Uh, the amount of repetition, I think we see it everywhere. Automation of bank technology, hardly anybody goes into a bank anymore. You can, 90% of the transactions are involved getting cash out of the bank. You go to a hole in the wall. It's a similar sort of arrangement with virtual assistants. It's there as the first call. Uh, it's there as a filter, and the remaining go through to the live chat agents. That's how we see it. So real, real quick, what you're going to hear is a simulation. It is not a live, uh, real recording of a of a customer call, it's a travel, so think of it as an automated travel assistant illustration. Um, and I think it, it's designed around a concept of how would this occur in real life if you were speaking to a human, very unlike what the, may, the way you probably typically book your travel today. Okay. Right? So, so we can, can play the clip. Play that please. clip. Good afternoon, and thanks for calling Orbitz. I'm the new Orbitz automated travel agent. You can speak to me just like you would to a real person. So, how can I help you? I need to schedule travel for a meeting I just booked. Uh, it's at the Cisco headquarters in San Jose. Okay, Mr. Fox, no problem. I was able to pull up your account using the phone number you're calling from. So I just need to verify your Orbitz account information. If you would, please say and then spell your username. Fox at interactions.net. That's D as in dog, F O X at interactions.net. Got it. Thanks. What's the date and time of your meeting next week? Uh, that is April 6 at 9 a.m. Pacific. Bright and early, I see. Based on flight availability, it looks like we'll have to get you in on the 5th. Let's start with your flight. I see that you would prefer not to fly a red eye. So how about a non-stop departing at 4.40 p.m. on JetBlue that gets you into San Francisco International at 8.20 p.m.? Uh, is there anything direct into San Jose? Let me take a look. There is a flight on JetBlue that departs at 2.24 p.m., transfers at JFK, and gets you into San Jose at 9.45 p.m. Keep in mind, the drive from San Francisco International to San Jose is about 35 minutes. Are you interested in that flight? Okay, yeah, let's do the direct uh, SFO. Okay, great. Are there any dining requests before we look for your return flight? Yeah, I'm going to assume they want to grab lunch after the meeting. Any recommendations in the area? Absolutely. I think you'll really like Hachi Ju Hachi in nearby Saratoga. I'll send you a text with the Yelp entry for that restaurant. In the meantime, would you like to go ahead and make a reservation? Or can I provide you with any other information? Make 11:30 reservation for three at that place. So we can stop the clip now. Great. I don't I'll want to take up too much time, but okay. So um, the point is, I think you get it, right? Yeah. That, that this is the way you would speak to a PA if they were arranging their travel for you. You would say, "I have this meeting with Cisco." It's not which flight do you want, and have to do all that. You know the calisthenics in your head right. of when should I depart because I'm really more interested when I would arrive. All those things can be sort of built into the right. way these so apps I, work. I guess the, the question that for you on that is there is um, some of that is automated and mm -hmm. some of that goes back to the, to the intent, intent analyst. analyst. That's right. Have you noticed um, that that workload kind of has shifted over time? I mean, does it, did it start out where a lot of it had to go back to an intent analyst and now the, the yeah. machine learning is getting better and better? Or? Well, typically, um, well, Classically, speech recognition is very good at certain things. Yes, no, numbers, simple phrases, stuff that's in the standard grammar. But every business has its own sort of unique grammar and lexicon that's specific to it. And so typically, uh, say, an application or a virtual assistant will go into service and be leveraging 80% human support and 20% uh, automation. And over time, as it runs, you know, the machine learning loop takes over and then the 
the balance tips the opposite way over time as it gets trained. And this allows you to get it into service really fast instead of waiting 12 to 18 months to tune the whole machine from the start. Okay, so, so the so. typical, the typical impl implementation is it starts out pretty human intensive to the, fill in the gaps and then over time. It may, yes, yeah. Okay. Right. So I wanted to ask Peter kind of a similar question. Um, uh, create a virtual customers that they, you have a virtual chat that's integrated with the existing live chat platform mm -hmm. and customers are given a choice between the two, the live chat or the, the, um, the, the integrated intelligent assistant. H have you s seen the preference of customers shift over time from one to the other or? That's a very difficult working? question to answer because it's very difficult to establish a baseline. Uh, some things I think we can say with certainty when we started out there was a lot of experimentation with these virtual assistants when they went online. They were treated almost as toys rather than serious tools. I think that's disappeared completely now. There's an acceptance amongst everybody that virtual assistants are, are there as a serious tool for communicating and getting the job done. I think a lot of it is to do with the promotion and placement of the links to the live chat and the virtual assistant on the website. Uh, I know we've got um, Verizon in the US, uh, have their contact us page have live chat promoted very heavily at the top of the page and there's something like 80% of the traffic is driven through live chat to start with. Mm. The virtual assistant link is lower down the page and I think they've, they've, they've done some work with focus groups around this and they're planning to redesign the contact us page so not only is the live chat lower down the page now the virtual assistant has a text box so they can actually type in the inquiry directly without having to click a link and then type it, type in the query. And certainly from the focus group point of view, they're, they're seeing much better take up just on this simple change of moving things around on mm -hmm. the, the page. As I say, it's, it's very difficult to establish a baseline to say that there's greater user acceptance, but I, I think in general there probably is, but it's, it's difficult to quantify. Okay. And so, Mikhail, I wanted to ask you, um, it's, lately we've seen this introduction of, uh, of bots on Facebook and other messaging platforms, and do you think this has changed the customer perception and, and their preference about how they interact with things? Would they rather interact with, you know, a human being versus one of these chat bots? And when, you're, you, when they're using this, this text input output mechanism, do you think they even know or care whether they're conversing with a human versus with a, some kind of an automated assistant? Yeah, so there's so much noise happening around the chatbot space. It's really making it difficult for people to make decisions, uh, like good quality vetted decisions around what technologies to invest their time and resources in. And I, you know, recently coming from Facebook F8, I'm sure some of you were there, like there was so much noise about chatbots. Like that was the next big thing. Everybody wants to have a chatbot for their company. They demoed six of them, played with every single one of them. And two days later, all the articles online, TechCrunch, even Forbes was like, yeah, that's a big disappointment. I think it's a huge brand risk for a company to put out one of these new manually trained chatbots for their brand. I think it's a reputation risk. Um, but I think it's overall really good because it's opening up the conversation for customers saying like, look, I can finally talk to my brands that I love through the channels that I use. So for me, the, uh, for us, the introduction of chatbots uh, is a, a net good thing because it's more about the channel that they're using. So I'm more excited about uh, being able to talk to my airline, my bank, or whoever, hopefully my bank, whoever through even Facebook Messenger, as long as it's not like super sensitive transactional stuff, um, I'd be more comfortable doing that. I really am not in a position where I like to pick up the phone a, a lot anymore. Um, it used to be that case, but and I'm sure there's still plenty of room for that and it's, it's going to be big. It is the biggest part of customer support today's phone, but uh, I think this new introduction of channels like uh, Telegram, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, WeChat, you see, you see these channels become very popular. And because of this, some companies might be inclined to build a chatbot to kind of be active on it, mm -hmm. but I think it's a very big risk, uh, but it's not um, a channel that you can ignore anymore. I think, um, you know, when it comes to chatbot, I'm calling it chat, I'm calling it bot mania, actually. That's, the, that's, it. that's <laughs> the phrase. And it seems like it's like two or three weeks old. I mean, it's just totally a high-tech brush fire, right? Yeah. It's going on. You know, I fundamentally believe that when people are interacting with their brands, that what they're after is three things. They're after fast, easy, and effective. 
right? They don't really, they don't want to go on vacation, right, with Verizon. They don't want to be best friends. They're after productivity. And so it's all about, is the effort low? Can I do it really quickly? And did I get the job done? Um, so I think about virtual assistants in a sort of ch ignoring the channel. Channels are a situational thing, right? There are times when speech is the channel of convenience for you. There are times when, when a text-based channel could be SMS, could be a chat interface on a website, could be a chat interface in a mobile app. It's all situational, right, depending on the preference of the customer. And what I don't believe in is sort of shutting off the oxygen to any one of these channels to force everybody to go somewhere. You know, you see this a lot with submerging phone numbers on websites, right, to say we're going to hide that number altogether so people just, you know. But what do they do? They Google, they find the number, they go to these other services on the internet and they call anyway. So channels are situational. And, and I think one of the interesting things we've seen today, just going back to the topic, you know, human versus machine, um, is that if you implement the intelligent assistant technologies effectively, it can have positive impacts for the, the humans, the call center agents, whatever, right? I mean, we've, we've seen that. Um, and then you, also, you, you often hear, well, are, are call center agents concerned that they're training their eventual replacements? You kind of heard that a little bit, like when Facebook M came out, there was discussion about it can't do everything. There's, there's the human assistants, but the human assistants, really, they're called trainers because they're training it to learn all these different processes. Um, I guess the question is, and Peter, I'll, I'll ask you, I mean, does it, it does there come a point, how, how do we keep that, that effective relationship going, and is there a danger that at some point the intelligent assistant technology starts creeping into the domain that really should be human, and then there's like a, a backlash somehow? I think there's a way off from that. I certainly think that there's going to be an enormous growth in the uh, development of feedback technology in call centers so that the self-learning for the automated assistants uh, will come to the fore and the role of the live agents their perception of that do they see that as a threat do they see themselves as developing their own downfall i don't think so i think they'll see that as sharpening their own tools rather because they will be using the, the self-same tools within the call center if i just go back to your previous point for a second though yeah. about you know, do people know or care about whether they uh, are dealing with a, a virtual assistant or with a, a, li a live person? Mm. What we're seeing is increasing what we call seamless integration. So when we started integrating, if we had a virtual assistant, there would be a window and they would communicate through that. If they got referred to a live person, there would be a completely separate window. Both would be branded according to the the business, but they will be substantially different. There may be completely different windows, or there may be different shapes and so on. What we're seeing more and more with this seamless integration is that the, the interface becomes unified for both the virtual assistant and for the live person. At the moment, we have a very common demonstration, as many people in the room will have seen it, where we connect to a virtual assistant and we have an avatar, and if the referral is to a live person, the avatar will walk off, another avatar will come in, but apart from that it's completely transparent. Now at this stage it's still clear that you're making that transfer from a virtual assistant to the live person, but that doesn't have to happen. We could do that completely seamlessly and transparently. And just last week we had a, an interesting query from a business about whether they could have repeat sessions with a, a live person during a, a user journey. So I, I can't quite conceive how this would work, I must confess. But the user would come to the live chat, go to a live person, come back to virtual assistant off to live person. They'd be diving in and out quite transparently, seamlessly. And the user would have no idea whether they're talking to the virtual assistant or with the, the live person. That's an intriguing possibility from my I, perspective. I have to agree with that. Um... 
I love that concept of machines and humans working together to provide a better experience for people. Yeah. And if you can make it transparent and you can make people feel comfortable and make the choice, like I'm the customer, let me make the choice if I want my answer now or if I want that personal white glove uh, service that w will be given to me by a human being. And if I could do that in one interface, perhaps situationally through the channel that I need right now, I'll, I'll be super happy. Um, and in terms of, if, if I may, were you? Uh, if I can answer the question uh, about the agents being nervous, uh, like the true story, you know, I just came back from Amsterdam, I was in front of 50 agents who were working there on behalf of KLM Airlines doing 80,000 messages a week in 13 languages just on Facebook and Twitter. 174 agents total, 50 of them I had in a room. And I'm there, guys, we're, this, here's this machine learning tool, it's gonna help, you know, it's gonna be automating lots of stuff. for. I've never seen so many scared people like look at me and I was like I'm a totally amateur mistake on my part they're like oh my god this is not cool this is not exciting I was like wait wait, wait hold on hold on let's <laughs> let's really call things what they are so this is your AI it's it's a tool for you to be better at what you're doing it's going to be making you more efficient so you can spend more of your brain power more of your time the things you're good at actually engaging with customers yeah I, I want to Absolutely, that's it. I think when you engage the agent's brain and where they really add value, they stay. And let's face it, running a contact center is really challenging from a staffing perspective. Mm -hmm. You bring people in, you invest to train them, you put them to work, and the churn rates are classically extremely high. It's a point of great frustration. And so if you think about you know, what we've had with CTI for a long time now, I mean, if you can Agents who, it's, I think it's actually well-researched and known that if you're giving them grunt work to do, you know, collect name, address, telephone number, and punch that in, they churn at a higher rate. And so if you take those sort of data collect, that's a classic data collection task, off of their hands and automate it, and then boom, here's the reservation ready to close. Now the agent can really, you know, add value to that, can upsell, would you like a bigger room? Right? Would you like to book a reservation for dinner? Now that the, the enterprise is much more interested in that than how good the agent is at typing in a name and address. So how do you professionalizing get, them is, is a positive of this for sure. I love it. So how do you get 50 agents to do the weightlifting of 150 agents and meanwhile spend more of their time doing more sensitive things that create value? So KLM is a great example because just through those social channels, just because they want to do customer care socially in an open environment, they're booking millions of dollars of additional revenues through upsell. And if they didn't open up on Twitter and Facebook and say, yes, we're taking a stand, you guys can complain to us and we'll address it publicly, they wouldn't have that opportunity to do the upsell and they wouldn't have such a high rating um, in terms of user experience. Well, I think we're, we're almost out of time. Do we have any questions in the audience? Okay. Right, well, actually, well. voice emulators in actually aligning the voice of the real person with that of the, uh, of the virtual assistant such that that pass backwards and forwards isn't too obvious because I can see that that would be quite tedious if you, you know, pass it to my colleague and back and I can't see that working unless you make it more seamless. Was that a, that, that's a question about voice, right? And you mean voice yeah. like speaking or voice like tonal voice of the brand? The whole thing. I'll quickly touch on the tone of voice of the brand. So we train our algorithm on the historical conversations that have taken place over the last few years. So the tone of the voice is automatically reflected in that, in those conversations. So that's that's really important. And also, there's two types of, uh, well, there's many types, but you can look at a generative AI model which creates answers to questions one word at a time. And this is how you get yourself into a situation that Microsoft got themselves into when they released their Twitter bot that started making racist comments publicly. Or you can have an AI model that still creates a generative response, then looks at the mathematical word vector of that response and compares it to an approved response from either a knowledge base or, um, or, or an approved set of um, 
types of questions that should be answered and compares them and finds the nearest approximation and only gives you the approved message or the approved answer to a particular question. And this could, doesn't have to be limiting, but the point is like, how do you prevent the AI from inventing crazy things and being trained on some agent's bad day because you know, they're rejecting all the good suggestions and they're changing answers to be terrible and then how do you prevent that and don't actually spit that out to the customer ever and preserve the brand's tone of voice. In terms of actual voice, uh, I mean, the world's your oyster, right? I mean, whatever you want to conceive, whatever business rule you want to apply can certainly be done, including, you know, changing languages, you know, midstream in the middle of a conversation. You could have a customer come on in, in English and it's clear that, that they're struggling and they'll get halfway through the conversation and say, oh, do you speak Spanish? And you need to be able to shift gears right then and there. Those capabilities are there today. So maybe I want to yeah, because I'm not sure I understood it either. Yeah. My point for you is that let's say you all have this opposition to answering the question, okay? And uh, let's say it starts with a real life interaction between you and the person on the left. So they are keeping with your voice, they know who you are, your identity, and at least by tone of voice and accent, etc. And so if you're going to have this seamless journey, On our side, we, we only focused on text-based mm -hmm. communication yep. channels, and it, I think that it sounds like that would be a lot easier than, than voice, although I'm not an expert on voice at all, so I couldn't tell. But uh, with text, you do have the ability to train the system with the company's tone of voice in mind, and you would hope that the company's contact center agents are also trained with that company's tone of voice in mind. Now, that changes based on an agent's bad day or maybe their personal preference. One thing we're experimenting with to help that is, in addition to serving human agents with machine-generated suggestions of how to answer questions very quickly, we're also giving them the ability to set up their own answers. So it's essentially the, the company tone of voice AI plus their own AI. Which, which they can fine tune themselves on the individual level and really feel like it's their own personal, like remember Tamagotchi games, like it's this thing you carry around, it's a little monster you feed. Like we want them to feel engaged, like it's their thing and they can train it as well as learn from everybody else's training on the company level. If I may, um, it's a subject, sorry, it's a subject I know a bit about. I think what you're suggesting there is the opposite of what you should be doing. I think that if I experienced a bot that appeared to be trying to be something else, my nature as a human being would identify that it's a trick in the same way that we don't like to get caught in loops, in the same way that we distrust things. I think it's the opposite, separating in the customer's mind what's automated, giving it a personality and making it work, and moving backwards and forwards between the agents is probably psychologically a much better approach yeah. than simply sticking everything through a vocoder so the agent and the, uh, and the bot sound like the same thing. Yeah, I think that I agree entirely. I mean, I've never had a customer ask us to sort of attempt to you know, deceive the customer or the caller that this it's is a person, they will ask the question frequently and say, are you a person or an automated system? And of course, that's up to the customer how we reply to that question, but the answer is 100% of the time, I'm an automated assistant here to help you, what's your next question? And that at the time a transfer is made, that's all very typically, well, not typically, 100% transparent, just the way you described. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the exact challenges is trying to create that human authenticity, -like, human -like right? Experience where it's not exactly going that's to right. be weird, like this. Um, what do they call it? The yep. curve of that word. Um, I want to thank the, the panel because we're running a little bit late here and want to get yeah, back you. on schedule. So appreciate everyone speaking here. So thank you. Thank you, thank thank you very much, guys.